Before we begin to look at examples of sculpture with surviving polychromy, it is important to note that the evidence for such polychromy is inevitably fragmentary. This is both because of the vagaries of millennia of burial and because many classical marble sculptures have a complex modern history, which has directly affected their surfaces. Traditional restoration, you see here a view of Cavaceppi's 18th century studio in Rome, and a restoration manual by his contemporary, Francesco Caradori. Regular maintenance at left a drawing by William Simpson from 1876 titled Annual Washing Day at the British Museum, Venus at the Bath, and at right, archaeological field cleaning have all affected the ancient surfaces and surviving polychromy we encounter. This is true both at the macro level, with the human eye, and at, in microscopic examination, where one encounters a bewildering variety of foreign materials, readily confused for ancient polychromy. For example, lead white, a material we've heard about before today, was used in antiquity as a painting preparation and as a ground. Historically, lead white has been applied to ancient marble sculptures as an optical brightener for badly stained surfaces. With this broad introduction to ancient polychromy, let us examine two pieces here at the Metropolitan. This slightly over life-size head is a Roman marble replica, or copy, made in the first century AD of an original Greek sculpture dating from the late fourth or third centuries BC conventionally known as the South Slope type, only the head survives. The right hand was raised to this side of the face, and the tip of the finger is all that is preserved. The figure wears a distinctive mitra or headband. The god Dionysus is probably represented in the semi-androgynous style of the early classical period, engaged in song. The original work, that is to say, our original Greek sculptor from the fourth century BC, may have been erected as the centerpiece of a Corrigic victory monument in Athens as part of the city's great Dionysia festival. This is the area around the theater of Dionysus, for those of you familiar with the south slope of the Acropolis. At least four other replicas of the head type are known, but only the metropolitan piece preserves evidence of its original polychromy. It has extensive red pigment visible in the hair and also in the headband, eyes, eyebrows, and mouth. This is a high quality work and the sculptor has masterfully obtained a very fine polish on the flesh preserved here in the recessed area of the nasal labial depression, which I point out here. Throughout the hair, there are islands of preserved leaf gilding, as seen here at the center of this image. Upon examination with the digital microscope, it becomes clear that a yellow pigment has been applied directly to the marble as a form of preparation or ground to, onto which the gold leaf was subsequently applied. So for example, here we have these areas of our yellow pigment on on top areas of gold leaf. This is disparate um, burial accretion, and we'll see more sort of similar phenomenon. Analysis by polarized light microscopy, x-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, and Raman spectroscopy indicate the yellow pigment is a form of yellow, yellow ochre. Here you see areas of yellow ochre and areas where the gold leaf is preserved on top. What's really interesting about, I've already skipped ahead an, an image, but I'll show you this, is that here we're looking at 200 times magnification and we have areas where we have an a, a area of modern abrasion exposing the white marble underneath. Areas where the yellow ochre pigment applied directly to the marble is preserved. Then on top of that yellow ochre, we have the gold leaf, which I mentioned. And then on top of the gold leaf, to my surprise, we have red pigment as well. Then more burial accretion, as, such as here. 
In polarized light microscopy, the red ochre on top of the gold leaf is morphologically similar to the red ochre found on the fillet, eyes, eyebrows, and mouth, so presumably all are contemporaneous. How should we interpret this red ochre pigment applied on top of the gold leaf? There is no indication that it indicates a later campaign of polychromy. Rather, it appears to be a preserved red overglaze painted on top of the gilding to impart definition and variation to its golden surface. Perhaps it delineated individual locks of hair, as often found in the red glazes on top of gilded hair in medieval sculpture. This over red overglaze reminds us that ancient gilded surfaces were not monochromatic and uniform, but were themselves embellished with a range of subtle effects. Now, it should be cautioned when looking at surfaces with this degree of scrutiny that no matter how large these microscopic landscapes look under high magnification, we are in fact looking at very limited islands of preserved polypromy. This type of examination is possible thanks to new recent developments in portable digital microscopy that allow us high levels of magnification at working distances of several centimeters. This allows us to see into the otherwise inaccessible recesses of sculpted surfaces of sculptures where ancient polychromy most often survives. We have noticed that the flesh surfaces of the metropolitan head have an exceptionally well-preserved ancient polish. Were these originally colored? Under very high levels of magnification, here I'm speaking about 200 to 600 times magnification, these surfaces display no evidence of a pigment application, even in the interstices of the marble grains. The red pigment preserved in the corners of the mouth and the eyebrows appears to have been applied directly to the marble surface as well. It would appear that if any pigment was applied to the flesh areas, it could have been either a very thin application or one that, due to its organic medium, has been preferentially lost. In short, we have no positive evidence for any applied coloration to the flesh surfaces. But of course, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. When taken as a whole, the polychromy of the, of the metropolitan head and the gilding of the hair, perhaps with a red overglaze to impart internal definition, the red paint in the headband, and the highly polished flesh surfaces created a rich, sumptuous appearance that was simultaneously, emphatically artful. Why did the sculptor labor to create such a distinctive high polish on the flesh areas. Perhaps an answer in something of the original aesthetics of the metropolitan head may be elucidated by a statuette recently excavated from a late Roman house in Corinth, Greece. The original aesthetic aim here appears to be quite clear. The god Asclepius is represented, enthroned with his left hand raised holding a scepter and his right hand held forward, supported by the fragmentary remains of a coiled snake. The extensive red pigment seen on the hair and on the edges of the garment and throne are all iron-based and most likely red ochre. In close examination, there are extensive vestiges of gilding throughout the hair, the drapery, and all of the areas that are painted red. The flesh surfaces of the god, in contrast, have an exceptionally well-preserved high polish, devoid of any visible polychromy. This image would have been immediately recognizable to the ancient viewer in Corinth, not just as any representation of the god Asclepius, but a specific well-known work, the colossal seven-meter-high chryselephantine.